Okay. So we're showing the lettuces at the different stages of development here so that you can see how, uh, how they start to go to seed. They get kind of tall in the middle all of a sudden. You'll notice they make this little tower. They're not a rosette anymore. And then from that, the middle of that rosette, you will get a stalk that will produce these little yellow flowers, which you will see as they develop through the, uh, through the slides. This one is a little side, but anyway, it is some. Um, you can see the buds developing. That's a beautiful uh, red romaine. It's got satiny leaves. As you can see, it's growing in among the companions there. There's tomatoes and nasturtiums around the red romaine. We'll show you a close-up of the nasturtiums in a minute, too. And this is a beautiful, curly, dark red lettuce. Just gorgeous. And so when you get lettuces like this, if you get a lot of them growing together, it's quite likely that they will cross and you will get some interesting mixtures um, from the seeds that you collect. It's the best way to collect seeds for um, cut and come again, uh, kind of thick planting of greens. You could mix lettuce seeds with arugula and Asian greens and some wild greens that you like and harvest them all when they're about three inches high and then they may come again and uh, they grow really quickly usually you know 40 to 50 days you've got good, good eating all day. They like to grow cool, so they're good for spring and fall. And, uh, you can see the little yellow flowers there on the uh, There's a couple of little yellow dandelion flowers there on the side. There we go. And uh, of course, these stalks are upright when they're growing. as well to splash through those lattices. This one is a lovely family of lattices all going to seed together. His buds are still very tight. And in the next frame, I think we see them starting to open up. There's a tiny little yellow flower. And so do they need the uh, pollination? They do need pollination, yes. If, they're, if they grow a lot of them together, they may get wind pollinated too, of course. But they do uh, need some pollination of some kind, and usually little insects love flowers like that. They like those little insignificant flowers. Usually what kind of uh, bugs that help to Pollinators. Is it bee or other kind of? Uh, I don't think it's usually bees uh, that are big on the lettuces, but I, I do see little, um, little little things like that. There there are bees, but they're not like the honeybee type bees or bumblebees. They're usually smaller bees. We have little many little wild bees in um, in Ontario, and uh, some of them may like lettuce, but lettuce isn't so much a well, we have wild lettuces growing here that they're probably more familiar with. Big, rangier plants. And also edible for the most part, although some of them are a bit spiky. We might bring in some wild lettuces if I could find some. Appropriate. Now, there you see the uh, lettuces have gone, to, uh, the lettuce flowers have gone to white fluff, and that fluff is ripe. There are some buds there that are still closed and the fluff hasn't opened up and there's some more flowers coming in behind but the uh, actual fluff there is ready to be harvested. Now what I would suggest is every three days or so take a paper bag into the garden and shake that head of fluff into the paper bag. And, but do it gently enough that you don't break it right off unless it looks like it's almost all gone to seed. In which case, you can just stick the whole head in a paper bag and let it dry in there. 
Mm. And, uh, and that's what it should look like. So are these uh, ready to be? Are these kind of things are ready to be collected? Yes, when they when they have white fluff like that, they're ready to so be collected. So these are ready. Yeah, ready. Absolutely. Do we need to make it more drier and just? It's, it's, well, it's you a good time to collect. It's a good time to collect, but they should. I guess it would depend on what the weather was like in your area, but normally you would dry them for a few weeks more indoors because they're not really dry dry for storage yet, especially if you're going to close and close them. If they're just in a paper bag, then that's fine. They don't have to be any drier, but if they're going to go into a closed jar, um, it usually it's a good idea to make sure they're bone dry. So after you collect from, say, the pictures we saw, we see, then you put it into a dry space for a few weeks. Yeah. Before you put it into a tight yeah, airtight jar. I would say two to three weeks, depending on the humidity level in your home. Some people use silica gel to dry seeds, but you can actually over dry them with silica gel. So unless you know, I would suggest just letting them air dry naturally. You see a good close up of the seeds there. Pulling off a few little seeds there Dude, just to five. show you that they will just come right off. Dude, do you want to get pleased? How do we know they are a good seed or kind of a uh, <laughs> well, you don't, bad seed? Well, you don't, kind of don't know what's bad. Well, seeds have um, oil in them, and when the oil gets rancid, I guess that's when the seed loses viability. But if in the first year when it's still on the plant and it's just developed, that should be a good seed. It might be if the if the plant has been undernourished, it might not be, you know, it might not have as much vim and vigor as it would have from a more healthy plant, just like. For a person and having a baby, they've got to eat well during the pregnancy to make sure the baby gets lots of nourishment. But if uh, if people go through a famine, sometimes there's uh, you know, some problems that the children might have as a result. But um, I think mainly it's knowing the age of the seed after you've stored it. If you know, if you put the year that you're storing that seed on your uh, envelope or your jar, then you'll know how old the seed is and what to expect, really. Because some seeds, as I said with tomatoes, uh, I've grown out tomato seeds that were up to 12 years old and they still sprouted. Whereas uh, other uh, seeds that I've kept only two or three years were no, no good anymore. So it's the different kinds of plants produce different age potential for the seeds to still remain viable. Say for the lettuce, it can keep for how many years? Maybe only about three, I think, usually. They have charts, and like they're, you know, some charts give you ideal storage conditions. Some charts give you, if you left it at the, you know, in a, in a, on top of your fridge kind of the if you let the seed get hot, like if you have your jars on a windowsill and they're baking in the sun, I don't even know if they get through the same the first year. You've got to keep them cool and dry and dark. And that gives them longer life. If you want them to last for a really long time, lettuce seed like that, if it's refrigerated, you can probably double the lifespan by refrigerating it. So put them in the refrigerator. Yeah. And if you put it into one of those freezers like they use for uh, the long-term storage in seed banks, some seeds are kept for 30 years or more in seed banks, but I don't know if lettuce is still viable after 30 years in the seed bank. I don't know. Fortunately, lettuce is easy to grow out frequently, and, um, and so we should just keep planting. See, for the seed bank, they are keep it below... Zero? Below zero degrees Celsius? Well, I don't know. I've never been to the oh, seed banks. Okay. I, I think they may even use some of that... Uh, Nitrogen? Yeah, they, they may use that stuff. I don't know. 
these things are un under mountains and, and it, you know, like we're not allowed in there. That's why we've got to learn how to do this ourselves because when time comes to get seeds out of the seed bank, the kind of seed bank you need is a living seed bank. And that's what we're trying to do with our seed exchanges and um, just our attempt to raise your consciousness about seed saving. Uh, we were talking about the sweet potatoes before. Another reason to save seeds is more and more things are becoming genetically modified. There's a big move now in Africa for genetically modified sweet potatoes. Now, if, you know, we start to grow the genetically modified ones here too. It's another reason to grow your own sweet potatoes so that you're sure that you're not getting GM sweet potatoes. So is they, they stop the GM sweet potato in Africa? Apparently, it was a big initiative there to uh, just provide more food. They thought they would be more productive. And sometimes for the first couple of years that you do these GM things, they really put on a good show. Uh, unfortunately, they tend to have a bad effect on the ecosystem and because of all the chemicals that get used with them, that tends to also have an effect on the ecosystem. So, um, please grow organic and, uh, and natural varieties. Here's our tiny little seeds. Have we got anything else there? Oh, we flash two there. Oh, yeah. That's lying down, but that's an amaranth. You gotta tilt your head there to see it. Uh, so if this uh, star is uh, 40, 90 degree uh, rotated, so it should be uh, upright vertical. Yeah, that's one of those. Um, I think that's a red root pigweed, actually. But it might be a cow. Um, anyway, there, uh, that's the, uh, one of the amaranth that produces the wonderful, nutritious seeds uh, when it's mature and the wonderful, tasty greens, especially as a cooked green like spinach. Oh, it's wonderful. And there's another amaranth. Uh, this would be in the Love Lies Bleeding family. Uh, but they're all equally ed edible. And they seem to cross pollinate by wind. These are wind pollinated plants. Is it uh, easy to grow amaranth? Very easy to grow amaranth. Again, the conditions you give it will partly determine the results you get. Um, if it's uh, if it grows tenderly, it will be tender uh, as a green. If it's growing in a in a gravel pit, it might be a little coarse, but it will survive. Seems the seed of the amaranth is tiny, tiny. How 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 do you collect them? Well, I would suggest that these seed heads are uh, if you cut off the seed heads and put them into big paper bags. So and these are the seed heads. Yeah. But wait until those seed heads are really ripe, because you should really check along those um, along the uh, along the spray. I'm just going to bring this over here because we can look at this again. You see this one? The seeds don't seem to be ripe yet. But this one, the seeds were, we were getting beautiful little black seeds falling out of it. They're so shiny, and you can use them as coffee seeds, you can use them as cereal, you can try to pop them. Somebody knows how to pop them, I haven't figured that part out yet. And, uh, popcorn. Yeah, and you can use them just as you would grain ammo, except that in an emergency, this might be free when nothing else is. It seems they are very nutritious. Very, yes. Well, many cultures use amaranth in different forms. Uh, from South America to China to India, it's, 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 big, uh, it's big business and big food. They say they are very high in uh, protein. The seeds, are, I believe, are very high in protein with amaranth seed and quinoa seed. I'm not sure what the breakdown is. Um, as greens, they're very high in vitamin A, 
and uh, the, the lamb's quarters is... Uh, the, the lamb's quarters and amaranth are both wind-pollinated plants, and, um, and they, they should be used pretty much interchangeably. I, I find the greens for lamb's quarters are my all-time favorite green. But really, I love them both. I, I can't say enough good stuff about these plants. See for the uh, cooking of the amaranth, uh, do you recommend any easy way to cook the amaranth? Uh, yeah, as little as possible. Just uh, I would just cook it lightly, like you cook uh, spinach or um, or other greens. You can stir fry it with a little garlic and oil uh, or. or Usually you would steam it a little bit first because uh, you want it a bit wilted. Chop it up and uh, just use it as you would a Swiss chard or as you would um, spinach, basically. So usually you usually you would uh, eat this part of the including the leaves and the oh, stem. Well, you would you would use the leaves and the stem when they're young. Okay. When they're like about ten inches high or so. Okay. Once it's at that stage, then that's you're keeping that for seed. Okay. So that's, when this comes to this stage, you you won't eat this one. Yeah, you wouldn't eat the flowers because it's a bit bristly. Okay. Um, but you you just collect the seeds and of course enjoy the beautiful flowers. Yeah. And everybody loves basil, and when basil goes to seed, it also produces those lovely little uh, black seeds. You will notice that um, many herbs actually go to seed in a similar way. Many herbs are members of the mint family, and they have these little tulip flowers, and uh, they tend to have wonderful aromas. And uh, and by all means, collect the seeds from that. Uh, let it. People tell you to pinch out the flower heads when they start to develop flowers, but you can eat the flowers. There's no, you know, you, you might want to pinch them out for the first little while that you've got it, but eventually, you know, it'll get killed off by frost eventually. So let it go to seed. The flowers are beautiful. Uh, we have a, a basil here, another one that has beautiful purple flowers. And some basil, of course, has purple or red leaves. So there's other basils we have to show you there. So How do we know when the basil are ready to be collected, the seed of the basil? Well, you see some of those little um, flowers have turned brown and dry. And yeah, those, those are the, uh, the ones that are ready and if once the whole spray is dry then you can just cut the whole spray so when they turn brown and kind of dry it yeah. it's ready to be collected yeah for most seeds it's a good idea to wait until uh, it, it is right you know I mean like the, the, um, the pod or the flower should be dry and that will the seed should follow easily so that it's ready to, it looks like it's really ready and ready to go. It will want to be there. So we have that red, yeah, there's the basil seed and a little dry papery flower. And some basil seed looks a little different than that, but there's many kinds of basil. So you'll notice that some of them are a bit shinier or less shiny, but otherwise they're pretty similar. For so some uh, rough idea of the scale, this uh, the base of the standard line, the paper. So the distance between the lines are uh, standardized. Then you can get the uh, idea of how small the seat is when compared to the lines. Right. Do we have that purple basil or somewhere? The Thai basil. Oh, well, okay, we'll talk about this then. This is Galen Soga, and this has just volunteered in the vegetable patch outside. In some years, it has a really good year, and this year it's having a very good year. It seems to have enjoyed the, the, uh, the early drought and the late rainfall. 
And uh, this, I think this is a native North American plant. I'm not absolutely sure, but it is really tasty. You should gather this as a green when it is very young, uh, before it has started to branch out a whole bunch. It's okay if it has a few flowers on it, but it shouldn't get all branchy and leggy before you eat it. Steam it lightly like any other green, and then if you have it with a squeeze of lemon and a little butter or olive oil, the lemon goes with this so beautifully because this plant tastes a lot like artichokes. It's, uh, it's sort of like a spinach tasting form of artichoke. And in that sense, it's also really good for soups. If you puree that into soups, you'll give it all artichoke kind of flavor. And it's free. It just grows wild as well. Uh, those seeds on, on that aren't ripe yet, so I don't have any seeds to show you, but I'll keep an eye on the gallon soba for the next little while, and when we have some ripe seeds, we'll show you. I will, is the seed is the part we use to consume? I don't know. I don't think it's worth it, because I don't think it produces that many seeds, even if they are edible. I think they're going to be fairly few in number. <laughs> so we use mainly use the leaves. The greens, yeah. The greens, okay. the greens. It's a delicious green. <laughs> so we've gone over the lettuce. This just shows you how very tiny the lettuce seeds are and these lovely little silvery seeds. Um, if you're happening to grow the black seeded Simpsons, you have black seeds. And there's a couple of other things in that family that have black seeds, but mostly they will be the silvery color. So, is any other um, other types of uh, the variety of letters is a different shape in, in the seeds? Well, or typical is the typical that's, type. That's pretty typical. Okay. That's pretty typical. The lettuce is very much more than the seeds do. Um, what you will find is that they will cross if you grow several different kinds of lettuce together. And uh, if you want to isolate your lettuce so that it doesn't cross, uh, then you will have to arrange, you know, to get a fly in the bag that you put over the, the flower stalk or something, but uh, or just stagger the times that you grow lettuces so that if you grow them uh, a couple of weeks apart, so that they're growing, going to seed a couple of weeks apart, then they won't be pollinating um, if things are being thrown at me. Here, look at that. Do I have to show you what I this is this is a public space, but this is what they gave us. I don't care. Collect the seeds. They're throwing things. I guess it's it's, it's a seed saver of sorts. I don't know. <laughs> and this is a, a nasturtium plant, and this is such a pretty flower. But it is actually related to brassicas. And um, it is a very edible plant. It tastes a lot like other mustard family plants. The flowers are also edible and look beautiful in a salad. And after it goes to seed, or it starts to go to seed, it uh, produces these little more rounded pods that can be pickled like capers or used interchangeably with capers. And, of course, when they finally go to seed, they produce a great big seed which is uh, very easy to harvest at the end of the season when the plant is drying out. What is the main pollinator of this? Uh, I don't know. I think it's just about everything goes in there from time to time. So there are the the insects. Yeah, yeah. Those are insect pollinators. That's why they have such beautiful showy flowers. Is it uh, very spicy? A little bit spicy, yeah, like cress. Got a bit of a nip to it. It's also very easy to grow. Very easy to grow. Yeah. The only thing with that, uh, with that one, uh, nasturtium, is it does not like to be transplanted once it gets going. It's better to just direct seed. So, can it uh, survive in the winter? Um, no, it's not. It's an annual. It's an annual. 
at least to me. I don't know what it does in other parts of the world. And this is, uh, it was showing you the Purs Lane. Remember the Purs Lane? This is the tiny little seeds. There's the Purs Lane, and there's the Purs Lane seed. And they are so small. And uh, yeah, they're great. Mice like to eat those seeds too, so they do need to go in the jar. So it's actually the rat tail radish. Um, not red, but rat. Yeah. As in the rodent with the long tail. But anyway, that's okay. Um, this kind of radish is in, in the uh, same family as brassicas, and we usually grow radishes for their roots, but um, this kind of radish produces pods which are delicious, and uh, you can eat them raw in salads, you can stir fry them, and they basically have that mild uh, sort of a mustard kind of, they're bit, sometimes they're a bit snappy actually, a bit, it, it can be a bit spicy. And, and they're really nice, and of course if you leave them on, they will produce radish seeds, and it'll just be a dry pod of radish seeds, but it'll always produce the rat tail radish. Oh, this is that beautiful Thai basil we were showing you, um, the pretty basil flowers, and this is a purplish flower, which is really beautiful, and of course that plant has such a good scent, the uh, leaves when you bruise them. Wonderful. What are the main uh, difference between uh, Thai basil and the regular basil? Well, I think all the basils are a bit different from each other. They just have a slight, like that, that one I think is a little more like uh, sort of a cinnamon cloves kind of uh, quality to the scent. And uh, maybe the European Genovese basil is a little more licorice or something. No, they, they, they all have nuances, but some people just really like one basil better than other basils, and just use them in the life, or use them all. Um, they will heard, cross eventually, too. I heard that the, uh, some seed collectors, they, when they collect the seed, they, they uh, regularly regrow the seed they collect, and then collect the seed from from the one they plant and then again and again. Yeah, well that's really what we should be doing. That way we know what we've got. You know, at least you know the parents of your seeds. And I think that's the ideal thing, especially in these times of creeping GM everywhere. That I think we want to know, not necessarily that we have collected all those ancestors of those seeds, but that we know their provenance, basically. Because this other stuff is getting voiced upon us in various ways, and we need to uh, know where it is. Because otherwise, we'll end up not even knowing. Well, I don't even know if we can keep track of it anymore. It's, with the corn, it's just out there. Yeah. In uh, Toronto or in the GTA area, is there any organization or group that uh, the amateur seed collector can uh, go to to get more information or hanging out with the fellow seed collectors? Well, we have our CD Saturdays uh, every, uh, well, in the early part of the year, usually February and March, we have CD Saturdays in Toronto. CD Saturdays are hosted um, jointly by uh, the Toronto Community Gardening Network and Seeds of Diversity Canada. And uh, in that group of people, um, Seeds of Diversity Canada is spread right across the country, but the Toronto Community Gardening Network, which includes such wonderful organizations as uh, our many community gardens and food share and uh, the, uh, the Hope Garden, down in Parkdale. These are, um, a lot of these gardens are very committed to seed saving. 
and to learning more about seed saving and to raising the awareness of it. So if you get involved with those kinds of organizations, there will be seed saving. See for the a, a beginner year one uh, seed collector, um, what's the best way or easier way for them to begin? Which plan the for them to begin the collector is easier for them to have some yeah. uh, good experience in the first year. Well, I think lettuce, uh, beans. If you let them dry completely on the plant, arugula. If you let the pods dry on the plant and get them before they split. Um, those are the pretty much the easiest, and, and of course the wild things. I think that a lot of people start out with things like beans and peas. There isn't much of a concern about crossing beans and peas either, because even though they do occasionally cross, they um, they don't really seem to need to be cross pollinated as much. So. They, they enjoy the visit from the bee, but it doesn't necessarily mean they're getting another kind of pollen introduced. They may just be being self fertilized. And the bee just shakes things up a bit. Bumblebees do this thing called buzz pollination. So when they visit a flower, they vibrate it so violently that it self pollinates if it has pollen in it. So it's something that just means that you get more development it's a more, a more thorough job of <laughs> so folks uh, it's almost uh, four uh, if you like to start to collect in your seat and uh, become your uh, become a food servant uh, group of people then it's time to start uh, seed collecting and uh, put more time and efforts into into your food that control your food and don't let other big corporations to control what you eat, what you not eat. Absolutely. Uh, is there a way that people can contact this website to uh, interact? Is it interactive at all? Can they ask you? We are going to set up a uh, blog spot website and uh, also on the YouTube, and we will try to get some uh, interactive uh, feedback uh, ways that folk can uh, contact us. And, uh, stay tuned. Hopefully next week we will uh, give the information about this, the details. We are still developing. We, it is our second show. Um, folks, if we uh, wait for the next one, the, the third show, then we will. Uh, have some email address and other ways of communication so we can uh, interact with and exchange ideas of uh, food and seek collecting for this uh, few episodes. Fantastic. <coughs> Fantastic. Thank you, Maria, is our host for this few show about uh, seed and other food and plants information. So join us for the show for next uh, Wednesday afternoon. Uh, the starting time may be a little bit very maybe between 2.30, 3.30, 4.30. Hopefully, you can maintain it around 2.30 to 3. So that's uh, time for now. We will sign off and see you next Wednesday. Don't forget to collect and see and uh, eat healthy.